Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. Australian Venerable Rabina Corton is the founder and director of the Liberation Prison Project, working with thousands of prisoners, many on death row across the US and now in Australia too. I mean, I can see for myself when I first thought about Buddhism, I was a bit of an old political lefty and before that, trying to bash the world into shape, you know, hippie first and then a bit kind of ragged or communist type thing and then black politics, then feminist. By the, by the time I was 30, I had no one else to blame, you know. <laughs> so I had to look at Rabina. It was kind of painful, but I knew there was no one left. OK, Rabina, you've tried everything. So that's when I bumped into these Tibetan lamas, you know. So here I am, somehow. So the thing is, I could see that, um, I forget now I was gonna say. <laughs> Your clapping disturbed my ego. I got all excited. Venerable Rabina Corton believes we all have the potential to be our own therapist, to relieve ourselves of this mental suffering. And she also uses the Buddhist tradition to explain why. So why would we want to be our own therapist? I think often in the West, it's a bit like damage control. There's an assumption that you just get born, you're stuck with what you are, and when things go wrong, then you have to go off finding a therapist. But the Buddhist approach is kind of proactive. Buddha assumes from day one, and you can look at this in this little package of the teachings called the Four Noble Truths. Buddha's saying in the third one, frankly, I think he should have put it first. The third one is where he's saying basically that we can be free of suffering. This is our fundamental potential. And a positive way to put that is you flip it over and it says you can be full of happiness. This potential we all possess is just something absolutely innate. So, and where this potential exists is very clear for the Buddha. I mean, you ask any Tibetan who's been living in his cave for 40 years or studying Buddhist philosophy in a monastery, what a gene is, what DNA is, what a brain is, he wouldn't have a clue, right? But they know about the mind, they know about the internal process. So take as a hypothesis for this discussion that your mind is not your brain. Buddha has no problem, if he heard about brains, that it would exist nicely interdependently with the brain. A decent working brain is very helpful. And indeed we can see signs, as we are all now in our, you know, the materialist world, finding all these marvel- the experiments they're talking about, proving physically the points that Buddha is making. That basically Buddha is saying your mind is your consciousness, not just the cognitive process. Mind or consciousness in Buddhism are used synonymously to refer to the entire spectrum of your inner experiences, thoughts, concepts, cognition, emotion, feeling, unconscious, subconscious, intuition, instinct, the entire spectrum. This is mind. And the Buddha is saying it's the internal process, you know. And so being your own therapist is absolutely fundamental to being a Buddhist. And this is where these, you know, this word meditation comes in, this thing that we so mystify, so gloss over. You know, for the Buddhists, and frankly, you know, many of the techniques, he took them from the Hindus, you know, pre-Buddha. I mean, they don't mind, they're happy to share. But they're basically psychological techniques. And, and so one of the kinds of meditation, there are thousands of techniques, but you can summarize them as two. But the first one, which is this very practical technique that you need to develop concentration. Because let's face it, if you're going to be your own therapist, you have to know the contents of your mind. So you need some concentration. So this concentration meditation, it's nothing religious about it. I mean, a communist could do it, you know. (laughs) It's, It's something, but you need to have discipline. It's very boring sitting down, just watching your own boring breath, you know. You don't, there's nothing really appealing about doing it, you know. They would say that we have much subtler, more refined levels of cognition, levels of awareness, and this is the function of your mind that we need in the long term, in Buddha's view, to tap, to access, like the microscope of your mind, where you really can do the most astonishing work of being your own therapist. So why you want to be your own therapist, why you want to tap subtler levels of your mind isn't some kind of airy-fairy reason. It's because the Buddha's basically saying, if we look at the second noble truth, when he outlines or summarizes the causes of suffering, the, the main causes are inside. The main causes of happiness are inside. They come down to mind. For the Buddha, mind is the creator. Mind is the source of all things, you know? It can sound quite abstract if we take our usual views of mind. But given the Buddha's view of mind, you know, that it's yours, no one created it, he would assert consciousness is, as I said, not physical, but it it, it continues before, 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 and carries on after, after, after. It's its own entity. It's its own river of mental moments. We come fully programmed, Buddha would say, into this life. 
So as a hypothesis, that's a very interesting point, but it has a marvelous experiential um, implications when we really look into the big picture of the Buddha and to his, this assertion here that I have the potential to be free of suffering. So then the main causes, as I said, come down to the mind. I mean, somewhere they talk about we've got 84,000 delusions, but it can summarize it down to just a few, <laughs> you know? So Buddha's saying the contents of this mind of ours, the contents we can divide into three. We've got positive, negative, and neutral states. So what Buddha's really saying is that there's this natural, organic relationship between the presence in my mind, right now, forget about the future, of happiness, contentment, fulfillment, well-being, and therefore indeed love and compassion and empathy. But there's a natural relationship between positive states and happiness. And by implication, and this is the real hard work in the beginning, the removal of the neuroses, the, the removal of these negative states. So therefore the, the, the Buddhist method then of getting rid of suffering and developing happiness is the method of learning to know, one, to know my mind well, and then learning through familiarity on the basis of having Buddha's model of the mind as my basis, learning to identify ever more deeply the neuroses, and then learning every day, and it's the hardest job we'll ever do, to go against them, to deconstruct them, to let go of them. So you, another way to say this too is, well, first of all, there's this nice analogy that Buddha has, that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So you could say, in a way, the bottom line is finally the compassion one. That's the political wing. That's the action wing. That's where you put your money where your mouth is and you get on and you're useful to the world. But as His Holiness says, compassion is not enough. You need the first wing, which is wisdom. And that's where you put yourself together. That's where you have your personal happiness, as it were. Miserable people aren't kind to other people, you know. If you're miserable, depressed, lonely, sad, jealous, angry, anxious, and not being mean about it, no need to feel guilty then we can't even see past our own nose. We can't even help a dog, you know? It's so clear. So you could say the long, the long term, and this is often, we can misunderstand this and get all kind of holier than thou and think I've got to go run around and be like Mother Teresa and we get depressed at the thought, you know? It all seems so hard work. But the compassion wing really is the point, and you know in your own life. Enormous well-being for you comes from connecting with others, being at work, doing something useful, helping the world become a better place when you have that optimism. But the method for getting that is working on yourself. The method for getting compassion, there are techniques for enhancing it, there's no question, but that's really the more advanced practices. There's this nice way of packaging all of Buddha's views in, the, in, in Tibet called the, the lamb rim. It's just, it just means it's like a course from A to Z. You start in junior school, then you go to more advanced, you get to high school, and that's where you're being your own therapist, it's in high school. And then the compassion wing is university, you know? So your capacity to be of use to others, to feel a part of this world, to feel connected, to be kind and the rest, is, to, is, is gained from doing the first part, which means being your own therapist, learning to look into yourself and having the courage to do this. But, you know, the usual instinctive modes we tend to have in our world, we sort of have, we live in denial of a problem, we blame others, or we feel guilty. But the other thing, I think, is because introspection is not part of our education. So more and more on the basis of this, can you imagine, as a little girl, by the time you're 20, you'd be incredible. You'd be an amazing human being. You'd be utterly aware of what's going on in here. You're able to take responsibility because you see it so well before it vomits out the mouth where it, when it's too late or before you just can't get out of bed one day because you're so depressed, which is how we are now, you know, because this introspection is not part of our life. Or if it is, it's sort of a bit, again, hit and miss. When something goes wrong, you've got to go break your heart to a therapist. But can you imagine, from the beginning, living your life based on the assumption that your mind is yours, based on the assumption that the goodness within you, although it's hard to find it sometimes, is definitely what defines you, that the neuroses, the negative states, Buddha would say actually, don't define us. They're really there, loud and clear, but they don't define us and thus can be removed. And then based on this view that indeed you've got the neuroses, look how easy it is to be angry, jealous, anxious. The smallest thing goes wrong, you know? The red light, our day is destroyed, isn't it? We can see, it's, we're so fragile. We want so much to be happy and to feel good and to be confident and optimistic, but the smallest thing can go wrong. So again, if you imagine since the time where children brought up with this view, the confidence in your own potential. I mean, life for me when I was young was just torture, overwhelmed by my own misery and how ugly I was and I was so fat and no one loved me and so dramatic and so much anger and jealousy and pain, you know, and believing that that's who I am, knowing I've got goodness, but somehow not believing it. 
I mean, 27 people can tell you how nice you are and how good you are. You're hungry like a vampire to hear it. But you'll go, you don't believe it. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right, okay. One person says something bad about you. Which one do you run to like a magnet? <laughs> Which one do you believe 100%? So it's kind of ironic. The irony of ego for the Buddha is that it's these unhappy feelings, that self-hate, and, which comes from attachment and anger and pride and anxiety and all these dramas that we just take as a given every day. The Buddha would say they're the voices of ego. And they have two characteristics, and this is really something when a person is working with Buddha's psychology in their daily life, attempting to use it, you know. We go really deeply in Buddha's psychology into... You know, we can say, oh yeah, negative, positive, sounds like simple words, but the Buddha is what is in its nature a negative state of mind. How does it function? What are its characteristics? What is a negative state of mind? Crucially, this one. Okay, so the very first stage is before you begin to even look at your mind. The first level of practice is zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. You know, basically the very first level of practice, Buddha's saying, back off and don't harm others. At least you protect yourself from, you know, putting unhappy habits into your mind. I mean, look at the world. If we just had decent behavior, like our grandmas told us, what a lovely world it would be. So this brings in one other aspect, actually, that's fundamental to Buddha's whole worldview. And this is this business of karma, action in Sanskrit. So simply speaking, speaking here psychologically, the Buddha's deal is that every microsecond of what we do, say, and think is a karma, an action, in the dynamic sense of implying a reaction. And where it leaves a reaction, forget the outside world for the moment, is within your own mind. Now, this is not rocket science. It's just that we don't talk like this in our culture. You know, if I say to you, oh, my goodness, why are you so good at piano? Well, you'll go, well, excuse me, Rabina, I've been practicing for 10 years. What do you think? <laughs> so what you've been doing is you've been, you've been living according to the view of karma, that every single bit of piano playing you do leaves an imprint in your mind so that when you wake up tomorrow, you haven't forgotten it all. So you can put your hands on the piano and the hard work of all your years is expressed. Well, Buddha says the same about goodness and badness, you know. So if you can see that, why are you so good at anger, Rabina? Oh, well, it's his fault. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. No, well, that's like saying, why are you so good at piano? Oh, it's my teacher's fault. He taught me. <laughs> How about taking responsibility? Buddha's putting us firmly in the driving seat here. Yes, indeed, you've got a good teacher, but if you didn't have potential for music and if you didn't practice hard, you could not play a note. Well, it's the same with anger. You know, if Fred punches me in the nose, if I didn't have the potential for anger, I wouldn't respond with anger as shocking as that sounds to us, because for us it's an absolute truth that I'm angry because Fred hit me. But equally, I'm happy because Mary was kind to me, aren't I? I kind of blame Mary for my happiness and Fred for my suffering. <laughs> but Buddha's putting us in the driving seat. That every, if we really did get the strong sense that everything I say, do, and think leaves an impression in my mind that is truly every day producing me, we'd be very cautious about what we think and speak and do, wouldn't we? And even this, again, forget the music one, but we understand the law of cause and effect, karma, when we think of food. We know nutrition really well. We know if that particular food will give me a bellyache tomorrow. There's no way, even if we like it, there's no way we will put it in because we know very simply that there are consequences to me of what I do. It's how we live our lives when it comes to physical things. But we kind of don't get it when it comes to our mind. We don't get it when it comes to our emotions. So what comes from this is this very empowering ability to own responsibility for what is inside you, to, and therefore to want to know it. So you see, you think as long as you really do believe you're made by someone else, you know, you might be a Christian or a Muslim, but you definitely think your mummy and daddy created you. Like Frankenstein and his monster, you know, isn't it? Your mummy and daddy made you, you know? I didn't ask to get born, we think. And that's in the bones of our being. And I think it informs, you look, it informs our choices and the way we respond to emotional things every day. The logic of blame is fundamental to our being. So the reason, again, of the reason to be your own therapist is very practical. The reason to know your mind deeply, because my dear, as Buddha would say, that's the source of your suffering. That's the source of your happiness. And when you've really got a handle on that, and what comes from that is enormous confidence in your own potential, which gives you the courage to never give up. 
then I will want to know my neuroses. I will want to be in touch with the anger, not to exaggerate it, not to make it worse than it is, not to sort of beat myself up instead of beating someone else up, because I happily want to understand the nature of that thing so I can learn to go against it, so I can learn to change it, not deny it, not blame someone else, and not just feel guilty, which are the modes we know, but to courageously take responsibility for it. What, okay, what, what also comes from the wisdom wing is not just confidence, but some enormous self-respect. Because again, the irony of ego, of these unhappy voices, the anger, the depression, the jealousy, is that I am, as my mother would always point out, I am my own worst enemy. Your own worst enemy, Bobsy. I was Bobsy. And I mean, it's, it's deeply true. Just look when we're depressed. We hate ourselves. One of the terms for a negative state of mind in Buddhism is the word delusion. Now, if you were called delusional, you'd be very insulted, right? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, we're all delusional, Buddha says. It's just a question of degree, okay? So you know when you're caught up in this huge attachment or anger, you, you're not in touch with reality for those few minutes. And the difference between you and someone else who's locked up for their delusional is that you, you, know, you get over it and become normal again. The extent to which I'm caught up in them is the extent to which I can't see reality. I certainly can't see other people. I see everything through the filter of my own insanity, you know? Check yourself, check the world. So, Buddha's view is, you, you know, there's this natural relationship now between lack of wisdom and suffering, equally between wisdom and happiness. So the method for getting happy, in Buddha's terms, is learning to know your own mind, seeing the neuroses, seeing how they cause you pain and how they blind you to reality, and lessening them. So as you lessen them, you get wisdom and you get happy, simultaneous. And now you're capable of benefiting others. I mean, it is the hardest job we will ever do to confront yourself, to know your mind, but based on confidence, not on self-hate. Based on confidence. So then on the, that you can change and become this marvelous person that Buddha says is innate within all of us. So there's your challenge, how to be your own therapist, according to Venerable Rabina Corton, founder director of the Liberation Prison Project, all at abc.net.au slash rn slash all in the mind. I'm Natasha Mitchell, thanks to studio engineer Melissa May. I'll catch you next week, bye for now. ABC Radio National podcast. ABC Radio National, on air and online, with many of our programs available as podcasts or MP3 downloads. All the details at abc.net.au slash rn slash podcast.